Hello and a warm welcome to this first of two sessions in our second series of strategic talks. Uh, my name is Mats Engman and I'm head of the Korea Center at ISDP in Stockholm. Uh, with me today, I have two guests. It's uh, uh, Rachel uh, Mi Jong Lee from uh, United States and Benjamin Katzep Silverstein from Jerusalem. A warm welcome to you, and also, of course, a warm welcome to all our viewers. These talks are aimed to further promote dialogue and exchange of views related to the developments on the Korean Peninsula and in the region, and to further increase the understanding of the many factors and policies <coughs> that impact security developments. For these talks, we invite scholars and experts from different backgrounds and nations to a friendly conversation for about one hour. The conversation will normally include two experts and we will strive to have a series of conversations within a rather short time span, covering the same issues, but from different perspectives. And this, we hope, enable us to identify possible differences, understanding, assessment and policies. These strategic talks are public and recorded but we normally do not take questions from the audience, but please, the viewers, feel free to comment using the chat function. With North Korea becoming a geostrategic concern, not only for Asia, but also more and more for Europe, what could be more timely than to discuss the domestic situation and developments in North Korea? So in today's talk, we will concentrate on the domestic, political and economic situation and development in North Korea, asking and answering questions such as, what is the current economic and socioeconomic situation? And what are the main challenges? And what impact will the improved relations with Russia have? To help us to better understand North Korea for today's strategic toes, I'm very, very happy to have with me two true experts. First, I would like to welcome Ms. Rachel Min Yong Lee. Rachel is a senior fellow for the Stimson Center's Korea program and 38 North, where she focuses on North Korea's domestic development and foreign policy. And she is also co-chair of the steering committee for North Korean Economic Forum at the George Washington Institute for Korean Studies. Ms. Lee was a North Korean propaganda analyst with open source enterprise in the US government from 2000 to 2019. So she brings a long professional experience dealing with North Korea. Benjamin Katzip Silberstein, he is an assistant professor of Korea studies at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He is also an associate fellow at the Swedish Institute for International Affairs and a non-resident fellow at the Stimson Center's 38 North program. His research focuses on North Korea society, history, economy, and social dynamics. And his dissertation from the University of Pennsylvania focused on the history of social control in North Korea. So with the help of Rachel and Benjamin, I'm confident we will have a very interesting conversation for about an hour. I've asked our two uh, guests to each make a short introduction after which we will engage in our conversation. So with this short introduction, please, Rachel, the word is yours. Thank you, uh, Matt, and uh, thank you also um, to the ISDP for um, inviting me to this um, session, which I'm very much looking forward to. Also very honored to be uh, joined by uh, my Simpson colleague, uh, Benjamin. Um, I thought I would set the stage for today's discussion by uh, talking about two key themes in North Korean propaganda. Uh, the 20 by 10 policy for regional development and uh, building up national defense. So I'll start with the 20 by 10 policy. Um, in January 2024, Kim launched a major civilian economic project called 20 by 10 policy for regional development. Uh, the mandate of this project is to build industrial factories in 20 cities and counties each year over the next 10 years. 
The ultimate goal of this project is to improve the people's living standards in local provinces by revitalizing local industries and putting them in charge of producing the daily necessities for the people in their respective regions. Similar, in, similar initiatives were taken in the past, but this one is different in that Kim Jong-un personally has resumed, assumed responsibility for the project and committed party and military resources toward this project. The divide between the capital and rural regions has been a major source of concern for the North Korean leadership for years, going back to Kim Il-sung's time. Um, in December 2021, Kim launched a rural, rural development project. So we can say the 20 by 10 policy is the industrial counterpart to that project. While emphasizing the importance of regional development, Kim said in a speech in September 2024 um, that North Korea's socialist system, um, in order for North Korea's socialist system to be solid, the grassroots foundation has to be strong. So he said this in while emphasizing the importance of regional and rural development. I'll now move to national defense. Um, Despite North Korean propaganda's fanfare uh, over the 20 by 10 policy, uh, North Korea has indicated that the country will increase investment in the defense and munitions industries, uh, despite domestic challenges like the flood damage in the summer. Although Kim's public appearances at economic and 20 by 10 policy related sites increased in the second half of 2024, his public appearances this year were still heavily concentrated in the military, defense, and munitions sectors, so we can see where the real priority is. Uh, there has been a significant uptick in Kim's visits to munitions factories and defense industrial enterprises since August 2023, and this is consistent with his call in December 2022 for increasing weapons production and also in line with North Korea's improving relations with Russia. It is notable that Kim himself in recent months has repeatedly underscored the importance of prioritizing defense development over the civilian economy, despite difficult uh, domestic circumstances and limited resources. Um, and as an example, I think we can refer back to Kim's first publicized visit to a uranium enrichment facility in mid-September. Um, the civilian economy versus defense spending has been a long running debate going back to the mid-1950s in North Korea. Um, but it is unusual for the Kim leader himself to go out of his way to justify the prioritization of national defense um, in speech after speech, which is what he has been doing since um, early August of this year. So for me, this raises the question of why does Kim feel the need to convince someone or a certain segment of the leadership? And maybe this, uh, this is something we can discuss um, in, our, um, in our discussion. So just, just to sum up, I think North Korea seems to be in a Pyongyang 2.0. Uh, North Korea never officially mm -hmm. announced a shift back to Pyongyang or the parallel development of nuclear forces and the economy since it renounced it in 2018. And uh, Kim, since um, as recently as August 24, said North Korea has consistently maintained the Pyongyang policy for more than 10 years. So in effect, sweeping under the rug uh, the policy shift in 2018 uh, to channeling all efforts uh, into the economy. And lastly, uh, Pyongyang 2.0 takes place under significantly different domestic and external circumstances than Pyongyang 1.0. Uh, which took place between 2013 and April 2018. So the reason I say this takes place under very different circumstances is that domestically, there's more central control over the economy uh, with market-oriented initiatives stalled at best. And then externally, um, I think we have um, a geopolitical situation that motivates Kim to focus on revitalizing defense munitions uh, industries, such as weapons exports to Russia and perhaps other potential clients in the future, and of course the foreign policy reorientation we have seen um, in recent years that calls for a focus on national defense. And I'll stop here. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Rachel. Um, so with no further ado, please over to you, Benjamin, in Jerusalem for the start. Yeah. Thank you very much.
Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I always particularly enjoy uh, talking with uh, um, ISDP located in my hometown of Stockholm. Uh, and also it's always fantastic to, to have the honor of being on the same panel as, as, as Rachel. Uh, I, I have to admit that I, so I'm going to try very hard to, to keep to my five minutes, but I have to admit that the, uh, the recent news that I see somebody already asked a question related to it about the uh, declaration of martial law in South Korea. Uh, it's, it's a little jarring. Uh, it's a development that, uh, will be no doubt related to North Korea that I'm, I'm sure we'll have, uh, uh, an opportunity to, to talk about a little later today as well. Um, so, so the things that I, there's a couple of things that I, I, I think are key to understanding what's happening within North Korea right now. Um, and they're related to, to a lot of the things that, that, that Rachel talked about. Um, and so there is a very paradoxical situation I would argue, um, currently playing out in North Korea. We have, on the one hand, we have all these things happening that should favor the the, the domestic economy, such as the the increased um, trade with with Russia, with um, and munitions and and such, uh, and the dispatch of troops, for which North Korea is supposed to be getting a lot of money. Um, and you also, you know, on, on, on sort of a less uh, militaristic uh, note, you also had a pretty good harvest this year. Despite all these natural disasters, agricultural production is relatively solid. Um, but at the same time, um, we're seeing prices increasing on the sort of semi-official markets in North Korea. And we know this through updates uh, by uh, primarily Asia Press or uh, Rim Jingang, um, a, um, a um, uh, Japan-based, I believe, uh, news outlet with contacts inside North Korea and the Daily NK based in South Korea also with contacts inside North Korea. So just to give you a few examples, normally, in, in normal times, um, rice, one kilo of rice on a North Korean market costs around 5,000 Korean won. So, so uh, that's, it tends to hover around that. But what we've seen in the past year, and I mean, we've seen dramatic increases even just in the past few months, is that it's gone over 8,000 won per kilo, which is, that's percentage-wise, you know, it's a pretty massive climb. The price for rice, price of uh, rice has increased by 63% since January. Um, and even the price of corn, uh, has gone up by 70%. And corn is sort of the less preferred um, uh, uh, type of food in North Korea. So if, price, if rice prices increase, uh, the, the demand tends to increase uh, for corn as well. Um, and you've also in parallel, and this is partially what, what I think explains the, 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 the rice, uh, the, uh, of rice prices, is a dramatic fall in the value of North Korea's own currency as compared to uh, primarily the US dollar, but also to a certain extent, the Chinese RMB. Um, so what is driving all of this? Why are exchange rates falling? Why is foreign currency becoming more expensive? Um, and why are our prices going up? So I think there are a number of possible uh, factors at play here. Um, we've seen in the past few months a very serious crackdown uh, by the state against black market money changers. So market trade as such is not illegal in North Korea. Um, there are fully legal and, and regulated marketplaces, uh, but money exchanging uh, outside of the state framework is still illegal. And you've seen, you know, this has been tolerated for a long time by the authorities, but there's been a very strong crackdown in the past few months. Uh, uh, to in order to make everybody adhere to the state set exchange rate, which is artificially low, much lower than than on the market. Um, so, so there is a general sense of anxiety uh, in in this sphere of the economy, and you also have, and this is where I want to tie back to to the the uh, twenty times ten plan that that uh, that Rachel talked about. Um, it's very likely that the state is printing money to fund these public investments. Uh, so that could be that could be one one factor at play. There's also been rumors about an impending uh, currency redenomination in North Korea, which the country did in uh, um, 2009, uh, which caused uh, severe inflation and great popular discontent. So there are rumors going around that something similar 
might be in the works. Um, but uh, it seems to me that the general thing that's happening is that the state is trying to take in more foreign currency from the markets to use it for their own means. Um, and you know, overall, this is and I want I, I, I about one minute left. So so, but um, this I think is part of an overall story where the state is working much harder and much putting much higher pressure on society to control both the economy and society as a whole. You've also seen in the past few years um, a very intense campaign by the government against foreign or capitalist culture, as they call it, and censorship, information control with uh, crackdowns on illegal cell phones being used near the border to China. Um, and I think that all of this could suggest a number of different things. Um, one is the, the possibility that, that, that the regime and, and Kim Jong-un himself personally, perhaps, uh, is much more aware of sort of a pro-South Korea or Western sentiments among the public. Uh, there might be information that the government has on, on these public sentiments that we don't have access to. Um, but another thing is, you know, this is something that's been pointed out by in the past by, by Tae Yong Ho, a, <laughs> uh, a former uh, North Korean diplomat in the UK, uh, that whenever North Korea engages with the outside world to a greater extent, domestic oppression tends to increase. Domestic social control tends to increase because the regime is even more eager to keep uh, news from the outside world from seeping in. So it might be that this uh, new level of exchange with Russia is making the regime more nervous uh, about foreign information coming into the country. Um, could also could also be related to the, the desire to keep deaths of, deaths, deaths of soldiers and things like that. Um, information on that sort of uh, beyond the uh, what, what the public can access. Problem with that, of course, is that this campaign goes back uh, much, much further. But um, yeah, anyway, I'll, 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 I'll end on, you know, to summarize, I think that we, things should be going better domestically in North Korea. The indicators that we have access to should look much better than they actually do. Um, so, so it's a big question of, uh, you know, why, why this is happening. And I, um, yeah, looking forward to to discussing this with with all of you and with with you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Um, I have two sets of major issues I would like to discuss with you that you have touched upon, both of you. One is, let's say, the economic side and and uh, what you touch upon, uh, Rachel, about these the new development plans and the statistics and the figures that doesn't really match. And the other one is about. Um, let's say social control, uh, the risk of uh, uh, less social control and, and what we can see a bit of a crackdown lately with new laws and regulations being introduced. Uh, maybe as you said, um, Benjamin, as a result of its external um, um, relations with Russia. But let's stay with the economy for a time. Um, so with statistics from North Korea being a little bit difficult and uncertain, would you, how would you characterize uh, the current state of the economy? Is it, if you take a reference with just before the pandemic, is it about the same? Is it worth? Are we on the brink of some kind of major famine like in the mid 90s? Or is it a lack of a proper distribution? So. What is the major, how should we characterize the economy? Is it okay or is it going down or improving? Do you have a take on that, uh, Benjamin? Sure. I mean, I think that um, uh, when we're talking about the economy, I think that we need to, to um, um, separate between the different sectors of the economy because they are all interrelated, but they're I think that they might be more separate than we often than we often believe. So you have a the to put it very briefly, the the military in North Korea it operates a large number of factories, not just for military manufacturing, but but sort of they they, they operate a whole host of enterprises and things like that. Um, and so so it seems to me that that you know the military side of the economy must be doing pretty well given what is happening with with Russia and given as as Rachel mentioned all these. Uh, this sets all this focus by Kim Jong Un uh, on these industries. I mean, whenever it's it's a pretty good proxy for for the the, the for resource prioritization. I think in in North Korea, the extent to which the leadership is giving attention to certain sectors. 
Um, so, so yeah, the military economy, um, it is probably doing, I mean, for sure, much better than it was under COVID or possibly even before COVID. Um, uh, but, and I would also, you know, one thing that I would, uh, that I would emphasize is the, the crucial role that added imports of fuel seem to be playing from, you know, if you have, you have a very significant amount of fuel, oil, petroleum, things like that coming in from Russia. We don't know the full extent of it, uh, but this is something that North Korea, even in, in, in good times, you know, in relatively stable times, this is something that it, uh, it lacks, uh, even though it, they, they've been, you know, they've been receiving the minimum amount that they need from, from China for, for many, many years. Uh, but this, this addition, um, it's, uh, it, it, it must be bringing some, some very positive effects uh, to to the overall economy, just you know something as basic as the ability to run factories. I mean, that's mm. you you need you need to do these things. Um, but you know, but but I I wonder because we're seeing so so much reporting from the ground about um economic instability. I wonder if those effects, you know, the positive effects that oil imports should have, and 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 the overall um and the the um. Uh, inflow of foreign currency that the, the the military sector is receiving through Russia exchanges. Um, it seems to me that it could be. It, it seems pretty separated in a lot of ways from from the rest of the economy. You know, normally we would assume that if the military sector is doing well, then that will be it'll be good for the entire country because people are gonna you know military are gonna go out you know shop more at markets and things like that. I'm not so sure that it's actually having a, a an overall positive um, impact, um, but um, yeah, it's it's uh, you know many question marks here on my end as well. Rachel, picking up on this about the uh, <clears throat> the division in the economy, is this twenty by ten policy that you mentioned in your introductory remark? Do you think it, can that be seen as an attempt to kind of energize and vitalize, let's say, the civilian part of the economy to, to reduce this kind of division that Benjamin was talking about? Or is it also a recognition that there are some significant problems and challenges in the kind of non-military side of the economy? Um, there are a lot of interesting questions and issues um, just, just in the remarks that Ben made and, you know, just this whole... Um, topic um, that, you know, we, we can pick up on. Um, <laughs> I, for me, the, the, the 20 by 10 policy is, it's a civilian eco um, economic project, right? Yeah. Um, meant to revitalize um, the, the local provinces and cities um, by, um, you know, building new factories and enabling those factories to um, produce enough products, um, enough daily necessities for the people in their respective regions. So, you know, this ultimately is, um, you know, Kim Jong-un's way of devolving responsibility also, right? Um, it takes over time, I think this is meant to take the burden off of the central government, um, you know, to have to provide for everybody for, you know, across the country. Yeah. Um, obviously, there's going to be, you know, upfront, you know, a lot of investment that will have to be made by the central government. But I think the ultimate goal, um, you know, on Kim Jong Un's end is really to make the 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 um, you know the the respective counties and cities and provinces um, more um, autonomous and independent. Mm -hmm. um, I think also, so officially this 20 by 10 policy is a civilian economic project, but I think we also, it's important to remember that North Korea, the, the, the dual nature of the North Korean economy, right? Um, many factories across North Korea, like 300, 400, I think, um, according to the South Korean government's estimates, um, they are dual purpose factories. So you have what seems to be a civilian um, economic factory, right? Like a chicken farm. You know, when you when you hear the word chicken farm, you know, what do you think? What, what do you think? Well, you know, what comes to mind? It's like chickens and eggs, right? Poultry. Yeah. Um, but you also see, um, you know, the the people who are in charge of munitions, um, the munitions department um, in North Korea 
um, visiting um, that, you know, chicken factories, for example. You know, so there are factory, a lot of 300 to 400 civilian factories across North Korea that are seemingly, you know, civilian economic factories that also have ammunitions or, you know, defense industry related operations. So my point is that just the, the officially um, the while the 20 by 10 policy or project really is a civilian economic project, I think that the, the secondary mission of this this project um, is to also help revitalize some munitions um, and the defense industries, which I okay. think uh, okay. feeds back into, uh, you know, <clears throat> Kim Jong Un's call for, um, you know, stepping up uh national defense um you know revitalizing um the national defense um you know industry um the munitions industry um you know i think it also feeds into um kim jong un's rhetoric um since early 2023 about war preparations because when you want the entire country and i am when i say war preparations i'm not saying that north korea is actively making preparations to invade south korea but, you know, looking at the state rhetoric, state media rhetoric, you know, there has the, the war preparations, you know, that formulation has consistently figured into North Korean narrative um, since early 2023. And when you think about this from Kim Jong Un's point of view, you know, when you want the entire country to be prepared for war, you you want you want each city, you know, each province to be you know, able to fetch for, fetch, fetch for itself, right? You also want everyone across the country to be loyal, you know, when that time comes for people to pick up their guns and fight. So I think all of this is really interconnected. And also, you know, speaking of revitalizing the economy, I think the munitions industry, the, the defense industry, um, you know, what Kim Jong-un is trying to do is to revitalize those, revitalize those industries in order to revitalize the entire economy. Um, and, you know, we have seen Kim Jong-un emphasizing a lot um, going back to August 2023, and this was on the heels of um, then Russian Defense Minister's visit uh, to Pyongyang in July 2023, right? Um, you know, Kim Jong-un putting a lot of emphasis on munitions and defense industries. Um, he's, he's talking about um, defense economic work, we don't know exactly what that means, but you know that's a new, rel relatively new formulation, which I think is interesting. Kim has been talking about modernizing the defense industry, um, so you know I think, I, I think by putting emphasis on the defense industry, you know he's he's looking for ways to um, improve the civilian economy through that. Do you, Do you think that this is uh, it? It is a a possible way forward to kind of energize the economy, the civilian economy, and, and not just get more shells and more uh, spare parts to artillery and new guns and Ethan to, to get something to the people? Um, I'm sure Benjamin has th thoughts about this as well. Um, just from my point of view, I think it'll take a very long time. The sad part about this is, and, and you know, Ben talked about increased controls, right, across all sectors, including the economy. Um, I th because North Korea has been doing better economically, at least since 2023, according to state media, um, you know, I, I think the lesson learned for Kim Jong-un is that he can continue to do this. You know, um, you know, maintaining stricter controls, more centralization across the economy, and still be able to improve, not only manage the economy, but perhaps even improve the economy a little bit. And, you know, with, with the weapons exports to Russia, you know, and, and in order to do that, you know, revitalizing the munitions industry, um, the defense industry, um, I think he is looking for ways to revitalize the civilian economy without uh, without um, without implementing Kim Jong Un's market oriented measures, um, you know, which he did roll out um, from the from the early years of his reign, um, you know, if you look at state media propaganda, um, the rhetoric, you know, the formulations um, 
with regard to economic policy. It's becoming it's become much more difficult to decipher exactly what North Korea's economic policy thinking is um, in recent years with the um, cease of the publication of North Korea's um, main economic journal, um, Kyung Jae Yong-gu. But, you know, you know, the formulations that point to reform market oriented initiatives um, have mostly disappeared. So, um, you know, that that's that's a source of concern, I think. But maybe um, perhaps Ben has more to add. Um, <clears throat> ben, if you could elaborate on this as well, if this what Rachel mentioned as this kind of focus on the defense sector of the defense side of the economy can maybe possibly also benefit the civilian side. But also, if you would like to be kind to comment on the role of that, say, the, the small steps in, in introducing some kind of market economy that came um, after the famine in the mid-90s, is that still uh, something that we see or is it more like Rachel kind of alluded to that it's kind of being cracked down and not having such an important role in the overall economy? Yeah, I'll I'll um I'll I'll start there. I think with uh because um Kim Jong Un's attitude toward the markets and sort of market uh, mechanisms in the economy, it's been as 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 Rachel said, it's been it's been um I mean I think it's been kind of uh you know it's it's difficult to decipher at the moment, especially um but it's it's kind of it's been there's been a lot of different layers of messaging I think. Uh, like it's for a long time, you know, even though the the sort of big, whatever you want to call it, Chinese or Vietnamese style reform packages, like none of that happened. Uh, you did see quite a bit of experimenting with uh, with uh, um, different kinds of reforms in agriculture and in um, enterprise policy and things like that in the early years. I don't think and maybe this is me projecting my own hopes and, you know, desires for whatever. But but I think that um. Uh, I don't think that's entirely gone from North Korean economic policy making. Uh, the reason is, uh, I think the main the main piece of evidence we have is that even though there's been all these crackdowns and announcements of new laws and procedures for how enterprises should operate uh, mm -hmm. and things like that, you haven't really seen any major move against the market system as such. The, the sort of on the ground people gathering in these uh, uh, often very, very large uh, walled off um, areas uh, to to buy and sell things, consumer goods, uh, all kinds of things, really. Um, and you know, there's been some reports of um, uh, shortened hours for for uh, to allowing the market to stay open and things like that. But you really haven't seen any major move uh, to against the market system as such. Like Kim Jong Il talked pretty frequently about how uh, capitalism or like capitalists. Uh, habits like uh, private economic activity were immoral and not consistent with our country's socialist values and things like that. Kim Jong Un really hasn't said things like that, as far as I've I've seen at least. Maybe Rachel has seen um, other things in her research, but um, so so I don't think that that's. I mean, but 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 again, but I, but on the other hand, I think we need to look at um, economic policy reforms as sort of a it's it's a moving process, right? Like it's it's. Um, uh, it's not a one-time event, and I do think that for the moment there's very little appetite and desire in North Korea to um, uh, to move ahead with uh, any sort of easing of state control. And quite, you know, the, to to the it's it's really the opposite of that. Um, and I think that I I, I want to um, uh, just emphasize something that, that that Rachel said, and I I really agree with this that um, Kim has probably seen over time that this actually is possible to do, like this kind of taking back control over the economy. It hasn't led to any, you know, massive, you know, like discontent among the population. Um, even within the elites, we, of course, it's very hard to get information on, but, but even, you know, as far as we know, there really hasn't been much elite pushback against uh, tighter control over the way that enterprises operate, for example. Um, and and I think that part of the reason why why Kim is is doing these things is because he can. Like North Korea, if you look at the macro level, North Korea is in a pretty good place right now, with fuel being more plentiful, 
um, and um, and this yeah the, the the entire you know new relationship with Russia continued support from China that hasn't really uh, uh, stopped as far as we're aware. Um, so so it's it's a pretty good time to if you want to if you if you've always had a vision or if you if you which I believe Kim Jong Un has had of uh, making the state work slightly more like it did under Kim Il Sung his grandfather but in a much more efficient way. Um, it's a pretty good time to 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 try to do that. And there were a lot of things that I wanted to to uh, comment on that or latch onto that Rachel said. I I um, should have written them down. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, but uh, yeah. Perhaps it'll come back to you, Ben. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Matt, can I add something? Um, and this is going to push us a little bit to North Korea's um, foreign policy issues. Um, historically, when North Korea wanted to implement or test out reform or market-oriented measures, which we conveniently refer to as reform, uh, North Korea made diplomatic overtures, right, toward the United States, toward South Korea, because Traditionally, North Korea's thinking was in order to improve the economy and implement these market reform, you know, market oriented measures, um, we need a favorable external environment. That's the formulation that North Korea uses. We need a favorable external environment. And that includes and, and the central piece of that always was improving relations with the U.S. Now, looking at the current situation and how North Korea seems to be still trying to find that happy medium between um, more centralized um, version of reform, right? So not completely renouncing reform. I agree with Ben. Um, I don't think they've given up on that. And I think they've come way too far to, to completely roll it back. Um, but so keeping market-oriented measures but in, in a way that's more, that's more um, manageable for, for the North Korean government, right? So greater central control. So North Korea has been, I think, in my opinion, trying to find that happy medium. And I think that North Korea has learned that it can do this. It can, again, manage, not only manage the economy but, and, and, and stay afloat, but actually grow the economy without improving relations with the U.S. and the West, meaning without the relief of sanctions, because now North Korea has Russia. China has not been cooperative in terms of enforcing sanctions. Um, so North Korea has found ways. It yeah. has found ways, and I think it has become emboldened because, you know, looking at North Korea's econo economy in 2023, and this is according to North Korean propaganda, you know, its GDP grew by 1.4 times compared to 2021. And one of North Korea's goals, as outlined in the Eighth Party Congress in January 2021, was to grow the country's GDP by 1.4 times by the end of the Eighth Party, the, the five-year um, economic plan. So by the end of 2025. They already achieved that in 2023. So I think that all of this emboldens Kim Jong-un. And, you know, he has less motivation than ever to improve relations with the U.S. and the West. And the other thing that we should think about here is, you know, what does Russia bring to the table, you know, for North Korea's economy? Um, you know, historically, not much after the end of the Cold War, right? Like economically, um, Russia has played a very, very small role in the North Korean economy. I mean, some estimates say that China accounts for 98.3% of, of North Korea's total um, trade volume. So, you know, that's hard to beat. But I don't think North Korea is looking for that kind of economic cooperation or assistance from Russia. I think it's different. I think, I think North Korea is looking to use Russia to diversify its economic and trade relations with other countries, such as Belarus. Right. Mm -hmm. And other countries we have seen, you know, um, Belarus just in just this year making um, two relatively high level uh, visits to North Korea. And, you know, Belarus has wheat, you know, Belarus has fertilizer. You know, these are things that North Korea needs, you know, and all of this. One thing that we should also remember is 
you know, North Korea has wanted to reduce its over-dependence on China economically. And I think Kim Jong-un is also, one of the things that he's trying to do is to do just that. Mm -hmm. may, may I <clears throat> stay with that for a while? Because uh, listening to both of you, I think, especially what you, you said, Rachel, and, and you kind of reinforced it, Benjamin, that this focus from uh, Kim Jong-un's side on, on, on the defense sector of the economy fits very well with its relations with Russia. So is there a, is it gambling that this relationship with Russia will kind of come to an end if there is a, a um, some kind of peace agreement or solution of the war in Ukraine? Or do you, both of you, do you think that the relationship with Russia is much more than just the war in Ukraine? It's much more comprehensive. It's much more long-term than just um, a marriage or convenience because of the war in Ukraine. Benjamin, do you want to go first? Yeah, you can uh, do that. Sure, sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't have a, a sort of yes or no type answer to that. Because um, I, I think it's a, you know, it's, it really is one of the big question marks. How, because I, you know, Kim Jong-un is not a stupid person. Um, I, I think we have to assume that the questions that we are asking, he has probably asked himself or they've been asked around him. Um, and so, so that's why part of the, I mean, if you look at what's happening now, and I, I, I want to, this is actually remembered what I wanted to, to uh, piggyback on that, that Rachel said, this sort of dual purpose of developing the munitions industry um, is, you know, North Korea has traditionally um dedicated a lot of resources to to developing heavy industry overall which and like any other country that that um, um that you know in general they, they're hoping for synergy effects they're hoping that doing you know building up the military side of the of the industry you can also uh build up other heavy industrial capabilities and and you know eventually sell sell stuff to other countries and uh, get hard currency from it um I mean, the, the, the thing that I would really like to get into to Kim Jong-un's head and uh, the heads of those around him and understand is long term, what does what do they believe that North Korea can offer Russia in terms of a trade relationship? Like what specifically are they gambling on being able to provide? Um, and I mean, as we see the world increasingly being divided into these two blocks or whatever you want to call it, um, it's entirely possible that North Korea, I mean, it could be a, a supplier of, of coal and natural resources, but that's also kind of, kind of goes against North Korean policy ambitions over the past few decades of not just being reliant on, on shipping off coal to China and iron ore and things like that. Um, but, you know, could they make cars that are good enough to sell to, to Russia or Belarus or other countries in this sort of sphere? Uh, what other things could they like industrial equipment, things like that? I mean, it's not impossible. It's definitely not impossible. And um, I just wonder how North Korea perceives its own comparative advantages in in this sphere. Um, so, um, but I I do think that, and I think there there is some support for this. I mean, it could be that the the uh, the regime understands itself to be a you know, long-term strategically valuable partner to Russia, not just in terms of exchanging goods and things like that. But in Korea, the Korean Peninsula has been invaded over and over again uh, due to its uh, very strategic location. If you aspire to be a global power, uh, you should definitely try to get along with with whoever is governing the Korean Peninsula. Um, there could be some sort of um, thinking like that, I believe, of... Um, seeing a value in the long run beyond the war in Ukraine uh, for Russia uh, when it comes to North Korea. There could also be a lot of, I mean, we've seen a lot of delegations of sort of industrial um, type uh, officials from Russia going to North Korea. And we haven't seen that much concrete come out of what they, specifically what they've discussed um, and, and sort of what they've agreed on. But uh, there could be much more happening behind the the scenes that we that we're not aware of in terms of uh, developing industrial ties. I do think we would have, you know, if there were concrete plans for 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 uh, industrial cooperation, we would have seen a little more about that in in proclamations and things like that. Because they've been very forthcoming with with military uh, sphere cooperation. So so yeah, it's very unclear. I suspect that uh, you know we'll have to. Um, 
think creatively and try to to wait and see you know what the next steps are on these uh in these developments Rachel do you see it as a long term uh relationship or marriage of convenience? Um, so just go, to go back to what North Korea can offer to Russia economically, um, I think it's likely to be on the munitions and industries uh, and the defense industry side. Um, you know, there's been a lot of speculation about whether North Korea could actually become like a weapons production base for Russia. Mm. Um, even after the war ends, in, in Ukraine, I think that Russia will need to, you know, continue to, um, you know, stockpile weapons because they're, you know, their storage is empty now, right? I mean, they have yeah. no weapons. So, and they are going to have to need, you know, to, um, they're going to have to stock up on weapons um, even after the war ends. And, um, you know, their production cap capacity is is not all there, as we know. Otherwise, why would they have been importing weapons from, from from North Korea. And I think in that sense, um, it could be a longer term arrangement. You know, there could be a longer term arrangement ju just on, you know, on that, um, on that front alone. Um, you know, you know, when we talk about long term versus short term, nobody can know how long this relationship will last, you know, in in, in this mode, right? It could be that, you know, they have, they continue to have a good relationship, but just not to, to this extent. Um, I doubt that even Kim Jong-un and Putin know themselves, you know, what the future holds. However, um, as I'm a propaganda analyst, I look at the, you know, propaganda for North Korea's intentions. On North Korea's part, at least, I would say that the intention is longer term and strategic. Yeah. Um, if you, if you read... North Korean media's coverage of the Russian defense minister's latest visit to North Korea. I think it just ended like a couple days ago. Yep. Um, and Kim Jong-un's talks with the Russian defense minister. Kim Jong-un is all in on this war. It was, it was shocking to me to read the level of detail in his remarks to the Russian defense minister about what's going on in Ukraine and how, you know, in denouncing, you know, Ukraine and uh, um, the U.S. for approving the use of longer range missiles to strike Russia and also just, you know, basically calling on Putin to take strong action so that the West and the and, and Ukraine um, don't look down on, on Russia. So, you know, like the flip side of that is, you know, that could be North Korea. He could be talking about himself. Like if he feels like he's being provoked, let like, you know, I'll take strong action against South Korea or the U.S. You know, if you, you know, if you um, replace Russia and Ukraine, you know, with um, with North Korea and South Korea, you know, in in those sentences, um, North Korea, Kim Jong Un is not holding back, and I no. highly doubt that this is the action of a country that is afraid of what Trump 2.0 might bring. Right in terms of any change in in Russia and Russia's attitude toward toward North Korea, you know, as Ben said, all of these questions that we're asking ourselves, right, um, about the sustainability of this relationship, Kim Jong Un has got to have asked himself, and I'm sure he's talked about this a million times with his associates, mm -hmm. and you know, you know, for him, him to go all in in this manner, right, into this war and and giving giving basically going all in on this relationship um you know has to be more than short term i think he's looking beyond the war definitely and also the other thing that we should maybe talk about a little bit is china you know north korea's treatment of china has been atrocious since the fall of 2023 it's un it's incredible how you know how cold and how dismissive kim jong un has been yeah. Um, toward toward Xi Jinping. I mean, if you look at the telegrams that he has been sending Xi, you know, very businesslike, very curt, very cold. Um, so, you know, if we think about how China is the one that holds the purse strings, yeah. you know, why is North Korea treating China this way? Because he thinks that he can just go back to China anytime he wants um, and the Chinese will welcome him back with open arms because, you know, that's what has always happened in, in historically. 
Um, or is there a more strategic shift in, in North Korea's policy toward China? Many people will say that that is not likely, but I think that's a possibility we should think about because a lot of things that we have thought to be impossible, such as Kim Jong-un dispatching troops um, yep. to Russia, such as North Korea and uh, Russia um, agreeing to a military pact, right? Um, those things were thought to be impossible by many North Korea experts um, two or three years ago. So, yeah. <clears throat> thank you very much for bringing that up uh, about China and, and and because that's that's a question in itself that we can have another webinar on. Uh, but I would like to spend the last um, 10, 15 minutes on let's say the, the domestic political situation and especially the uh, the internal stability issue, which, if I understand it correctly has been and still is one of Kim Jong-un's top priorities to control his people. And it, it is already maybe one of the most controlled societies and nations in the world. But we have recently seen several new regulations and actions to even strengthen that already very strict control. New laws targeting the younger generation, increased ideological training for the military, etc. So do you think, and this is to both of you, do you think that the regime and Kim Jong-un is worried it's losing some of its control over its people and maybe even concerned about the military's loyalty and reliability? Because some of these things that, especially related to the military, is quite unprecedented as I understand it. This battalion commander's level training, that is not something usually they do. So how how do you see this? Is 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 he still in firm control of the uh, domestic, political, and social situation? Maybe to you, Benjamin, to start. Uh, that that is a a question that I do think we have a yes or no answer to. I think the answer is yes. Uh, that that uh, but the, just the bar for even talking about social instability in North Korea is so I want to say low or high. Like it's just something that is so. The, the, the basic level of uh, social control in North Korea is just very, very high. Like it's, and it's been that way for decades. Um, and I think that, you know, thinking about all these new laws and regulations and things like that, I think that the thing that the government is trying to get to might not be disobedience or like any sort of political upheaval, but I think they're worried about complacency in a lot of ways. Like I think mm -hmm. they're, they're worried that because um, one of the one of the more, in my opinion, uh, most interesting new um, uh, sort of policy procl proclamations on social control as of late is this uh, new uh, new decree uh, to um, about reporting each other. Basically, yeah. saying, I believe this was um, that this one came in twenty twenty two, but it was just recently published by the Daily NK. Um, all these these different emphases on um, units in society that that have to report if they see any signs of disobedience, like any any sort of you know any anyone hearing anything about someone listening to South Korean music or or um, uh, you know joking in a mean spirited way about the state, which is a a, a, a big offense. Um, so I think that they what they want is more perhaps active participation by the people in this because for so, for for a long time i mean there's been these things in north korean society that are theoretically very very illegal but that everybody does i mean you have you know i i think i i, I would venture to guess that there are pretty few state security agents in north korea that have not watched a single episode of a south korean drama series for example like the, the all levels of society are um complacent in this uh implicit yeah they're they're, they're part of it um so so i i I think that what they're, and I think you have to also factor in the, the what, what Rachel brought up before, um, this um, idea of preparing for war, essentially, which, which again, like, like Rachel said, doesn't mean that North Korea necessarily is going or planning to go to war anytime soon, but being prepared for war is something different. It means tying all of society together, you know, having um, just... Um, I mean, the whole the whole idea of, you know, ideologically, theoretically of, of North Korean society is that it should be like one body and the leadership should be the head. Like this is part of sort of uh, Chuche philosophy, philosophical thinking, 
Um, so I think that that's that's kind of what they're what they're going for. I've really, and I also wonder if there has been in this. Uh, I know you want to focus domestically, but I but I think, um, I mean, if you look at the developments internationally, part of the North Korean worldview has been kind of vindicated. Like they're, they're they've always been sort of looking forward to this. The, the this glorious day when the capitalist uh, imperialist forces uh, they 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 uh, enter this glorious holy war against uh, the the you know anti imperialist independent forces. Um, I think that if you know I think Kim Jong Un it seems at least from from the speeches uh, as of late it seems that he's pretty even though he's young you know he's pretty well read on this stuff like he he has he's managed to to uh, to really grab onto a cold war. what we thought was a Cold War era mentality and make it his own. Um, so I think that that's, you know, part of part of all these uh, crackdowns and, and um, reinforced regulations. Um, it's about making people more, you know, more part of his own mission of having the population with him in, in this um, on this journey or whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, it's it's super interesting stuff. And I, I hope we get another occasion in the future to talk about it. Um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Rachel, do you agree that he's still in, in firm control? I have no doubt that he is. Okay. Um, you know, North Korea for decades has, you know, managed to create and refine its state surveillance system, right? Um, and there's nothing in North Korean media, as I can see, um, that would indicate that Um, Kim Jong Un's leadership is in jeopardy, or there is some kind of, um, you know, concern about regime security. I, I, you know, people often talk about, well, you know, the economic hardships, but you know, when is the last time really that North Korea has not had an economic hardship since the early 1990s? You know, it's 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 a chronic situation. So that's something that we have to keep in mind. when we talk about how difficult, you know, North Korea's um, economic situation is. Um, you know, going back to the series of North Korean, um, the North Korean leader's appearances at, you know, military, um, you know, units and, you know, his military related public appearances, um, you know, there we, we should also recall that there was an incident, right, in October um, about an alleged drone incursion into Pyongyang airspace. Yes. Right. Which North Korea, you know, um, claims is is South Korea's. Nobody knows where that drone came from and, you know, who sent the drones. Um, we do. We I, I don't think North Korea is making it up. You know, I, I, did, I do think that it happened. Um, but, you know, because because of what happened, you know, I think North Korea felt compelled. Kim Jong Un felt compelled to make some more military visits. But, you know, overall, the trend has been, you know, again, Um, much more emphasis on military defense, you know, nuclear capabilities, um, you know, in, in, in recent years, um, despite North Korea being in, in Pyongyang 2.0 mode. Um, it, it's a shame that we're running out of time, but maybe in the future, perhaps we can have, uh, we can talk a little more about, um, you know, nor how North Korea's rolled out or not rolled out its uh, to Korea's policy. Um, mm -hmm. It's been very interesting that um, how gingerly they're treating this issue. Um, it's clear, it's been clear for a number of years in recent, going back to, I would say the summer of 2019. So a few months in the, in the aftermath of the Hanoi summit's collapse, that North Korea was having a rethink about South Korea and unification. There were indicators. Uh, and Kim Jong-un, um, late last year in December, um, you know, talked about, he announced his um, two Korea's policy, right? And so the policy making was in the works for years, but the way they're implementing it is very interesting because we still don't know if they revised the constitution, exactly. you know, related to South Korea, the new territory, the borders, We don't know anything about that. They may have revised the constitution. They may not have. We all, the only thing we know is that they added a provision in the constitution defining South Korea as a complete hostile state. That's the only thing we know. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like North Korea is still trying to find a way to convince the public that this is the that this that this is the right policy, right? Um, there's it seems like they're still trying to find a way to. implement this right 
And I don't think they figured that out just yet. Or maybe they feel like the timing isn't right. But, you know, that's a topic for another day. <laughs> <clears throat> I, I know that we're running out of time, but I cannot resist the temptation to ask you a quick one on the news that just came in before we mm -hmm. opened the, the, the session on the introduction of martial law in South Korea. Even this was a, a, a session on a talk on North Korea. So just a quick take uh, from uh, maybe not having thought about it very much, uh, Benjamin. What, what's your a quick take before we end this on the, the martial law in, in South Korea? I was really hoping you weren't going to ask me to go first. But uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, is, I, I, it is very, I mean, it seems to be coming out of the blue in, in many ways. And, and, and um, with, I mean, we do have, you know, increased tensions on the peninsula and North Korean trash balloon, I mean, all of that. Um, my hunch is that this has much more domestic reasons than, uh, uh, than, than I might, you know, be able to, to talk in an educated way about right now. Um, I, because I think that, you know, a lot of the, 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 the language that's been coming out talks about like stopping pro North Korean forces, things like that. That is an old trope in South Korean politics for just political enemies, essentially. I don't think that it's a literal, that it literally means that the government is afraid of a North Korea-backed coup in South Korea. But yeah, it's going to be uh, a lot of refreshing uh, yeah. <laughs> sources tonight. So. Okay. Uh, when when Ben first mentioned um, martial law before, just before um, we started this, this this session, I thought he was talking about North Korea. Yeah. So I, I did not know that he was talking about South Korea. So you can kind of see where my thinking is on this. Um, this is a developing story, so we don't really know um, for sure what's driving this. It does seem like it's more domestically oriented than um, external. Um, it sounds like um, the defense minister uh, recommended to uh, President Yoon to announce, uh, to proclaim this martial law. Uh, the timing of the day is interesting. This came um, after 10 p.m. South Korea time. So that speaks to the urgency of the issue. Again, we don't know what's driving this. But we do also know that um, President Yoon has been beleaguered on the domestic uh, political front, right? Um, if you look at the makeup of the National Assembly, um, you know, he doesn't have a lot of clout, his, the ruling party. Um, and the opposite, the main opposition party has been blocking a lot of bills. Um, the, the budget for 2025, for example, it seems like uh, they have been blocking that too. So um, I think they're taking a major gamble with this and I think we're just going to have to see it. One thing, one last thing is that it seems like, according to the South Korean constitution, um, if more than half of the assemblymen um, dis uh, um, approve, then they can actually um, overturn this uh, martial law okay. there okay. by the president. So we don't know how long this is going to last because the main opposition party does have a lot of members and um, it looks like the ruling party is against this as well. So he's not going to have the, the President Yoon is not going to have the support of the ruling party. Okay. Thank you very much, Rachel and Benjamin. And thank you also to all our viewers. Um, this, uh, the whole subject was much more than one hour. And especially when you have such a, a knowledgeable um, people on board uh, that can share their extensive knowledge. I think it was fascinating to listen to you um, and to see that Everything is not what it looks to be from the outside. You need to follow, the, and especially a country like North Korea, you need to have the history, the trajectory, the wordings in order to fully understand and appreciate what's going on and what's happening. So thank you very much, Benjamin and Rachel, for joining me today. And I hope our viewers also enjoyed the conversation and learned something. Just before we close the shop, we have a uh, the second uh, session with the same kind of topic on 10 December at nine o'clock Swedish time with a, a Japanese expert and a, another expert from uh, South Korea. So please join us now. And with this, close for today. And thank you very much, Benjamin and Rachel. And see you soon, hopefully. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.